Good morning, everybody. It's, uh, it's kind of interesting to be up here since I was in the bar last night. I wonder how many people are going to pay attention to me. How many people are capable of paying attention to me? We'll see. Um, <clears throat> so I noticed that um, in the conference presentation, this talk has had, on the website, it's 802.11 AC uh, deployment. In one of the handouts I got, it's not just a phase. I kind of like that. None of the other inner networks want to play with me. Um, <clears throat> so that's, the, that, that's what Keith asked me to talk about. And really, like, I don't need slides. At this point, I can get up and basically vomit for an hour on 802.11 AC. And most people find it interesting. But I had to be a little better for you guys. So 802.11 AC comes out in multiple phases. We write a standard. It takes forever to put it together and, and ship products. So I was trying to think of what it's like to, uh, to describe this. And I came across the, this thing that Yogi Berra said, who I love. And yes, for all you Yankee fans out there or watching the tape, that is Yogi Berra in a Mets uniform because I hate your team. <laughs> so he said, you've got to be very careful about where you're going. Because if you don't know where you're going, you might not get there. And you know, very fittingly, I mangled the quote because it's just so hard to quote him accurately. Um, and really, if, I had, if I'd faded in the name, who else could this be? So what are we going to talk about? Well, what it's like to design for 802.11ac today, how we're just getting started, and what this means for you in terms of designing networks in the future. So what does it mean today? Well, in a word, it's about density. So I was trying to think of ways I could convey the concept of density. It's like, you know, we talk about how hard this is and what it's like to have traffic jams. So I asked Google Images for a picture of a traffic jam, and half of what I got was Chris Christie's face. <laughs> Instead, so the top picture there is the George Washington Bridge. It's a holiday weekend in the 50s. And I thought, oh, that's, that's interesting. That's what it looks like now. Um, I had a business trip a few years ago where I had to go from Pennsylvania out to Long Island, which meant that I basically had to drive through Manhattan. Um, and it was horrible. After I was done, I said, I am never doing that again. And I never have. Um, <clears throat> so that's a holiday weekend from the 50s. It's what it looks like on a normal day now. Um, <clears throat> so. I was thinking about this as, okay, so we had this level of density before. That was the peak density when things were really bad in the 50s. It's what it looks like now. That's really what's happened to our Wi-Fi networks. That we built 11N, we know how to design for it, and unfortunately what happened is that it was great, as another great baseball movie put it, if you build it, they will come, and they did. When we designed 11AC, yes, we're trying to do better with density. And there's a lot of stuff that's the same as 11N. So, you know, we're, we can put one wire to the AP. Multipath is still really cool because you get multiple paths and that's what gives you speed. <sighs> yes, I'm sorry for those of you who don't like, who, who do like weapon TKIP, still dead. <laughs> it's going to be that way for a while, especially if I have anything to say about it. So really, this is about Increasing capacity. Capacity is good. So what do you do? And so I was thinking about this bridge metaphor a little bit. <clears throat> if you've got a bridge that's at capacity, what do you do? And you can put another deck on if it was designed for that. <clears throat> or you can do what happened in the, picture, the, the second picture on the right. That's the Carquinas Bridge in California. When they ran out of capacity there, they just built one right next to it. Um, <clears throat> I've been over both of them. One of them obviously has a better view than the others. Than the other, the, the one on the right in the picture is a, an old truss. The one on the left is actually good looking. Um, and it, it carries the same highway. It's Interstate 80 uh, going uh, one bridge in each direction. Um, so that's the bridge I go over when I go up to Tahoe to go flying. Um, I am very unusual for somebody who lives in the Bay Area in that I go to Tahoe in the summers. Um, I, I'm not brave enough to do it in the winter. 
So we've done all this to increase capacity. So when we, when we increase capacity, we change the way that networks get built. Well, hmm. You guys know all this stuff, though. It's actually a real town in Oregon. There's a guy named Boring who was a miner, and he, he set up a town. Um, so, town of Boring, Oregon. It's got exits to it. It's a real town. You get to it off the highway and everything. But what makes this really good, as I was trying to, to come up with an image for Boring, because the other thing I don't want to be is Boring's sister city, <laughs> which is in Scotland. <clears throat> so, uh, the towns of Boring and Dell are sister cities. You can go to both of them. Uh, motto of Boring is the most exciting place to be. <laughs> Probably because all they had to do to promote tourism was have their name. All right. So how does 802.11ac change what you do? And I know many of you have seen this or some variation on this uh, many times before. And <clears throat> this is uh, one of the big reasons why we have to think about what it means all the way out in the future with future products we're building as we design networks today. So we got really four features in 802.11ac. That's the case, why was my book so many pages? Why wasn't it only four pages, one for each feature? So four main features. There's a whole lot of stuff in there. Um, many of you probably know that the 802.11 working group has voting rules where to make a technical change, meaning I want to change the behavior of an implementation, the proposal needs to get a 75% vote. What this means, you know the old saying about a camel being a horse designed by committee? <laughs> Let's say you have 26% of the working group that really, really wants something. The easiest thing to do is put it in and make it optional. Keep that in mind whenever you read the spec. So there's a whole bunch of stuff. Um, in fact, one of the reviewers of the book, I won't tell you which one, said, I noticed you didn't talk about this feature. And I said, yes, I, that's right. I didn't think it was very useful. And he said, well, but you should talk about it because you're not heaping enough scorn on it. And he then helpfully had suggestions about how I should, how I should talk about this feature and then how I should talk about how dumb it was. I chose to leave it out. Um, this is probably better for you, uh, given the amount of uh, the, the suggestion and the volume of his suggestion, um, you wouldn't be able to carry the book home. So keeping it thin so it fits in your bag. Um, true story, books also look like plastic explosive. Keep that in mind when you go through the checkpoint. <laughs> um, I, uh, I know somebody once who was, um, had, had a bag pulled aside, searched very carefully, and the, it was actually the, the TSA security person who said, yep, these things look like plastic explosive. The person said, hmm, but I'd like to read, what should I do? And the helpful response from such an educated person who was obviously very conscious of security risk assessments said, stop reading. <laughs> But I digress. We've got a couple of waves of 802.11ac. This is the problem when you write a 500 page spec is that you can't do it all at once. So what do you do? And the answer is you do what every vendor everywhere does. I've got a big list of things I wanna do. Some of them are easy to do. Some of them are harder to do. I'm going to put together a proposed roadmap where I, I do this and I try and make it work as best I can. So the first wave of 11ac, which is out now, gives you, if you add it up, call it twice what 11n is. That's nice. You know, I'd, I'd love to be paid twice what I am now. But twice doesn't really, that's not exciting in networking. We really need to get 10x before people get excited. What? I actually can't hear that well up here. And I know it's not the lights. The lights affect how I can see. Um, so when we get the second wave, we're probably looking at, I don't know, 10, 15, maybe 20. There's a lot that you can do with the assumptions. That's why there are tildes all over the place. So we're looking at a future where we have potentially 
10 to 20 times the speed we do now. So what does this mean? Well, first of all, I found some really cool graphics to illustrate density. These are unrelated to Wi-Fi at all, except perhaps to talk about the difficulty of building Wi-Fi in a couple of places. The top one is a graph of New York City census wards where the height is proportional to the number of people in them. So not surprisingly, you see Manhattan's got a lot more red. Um, as an interesting scaling note, you've got Staten Island there on the left-hand side of the picture. The tallest county on Staten Island looks like it's not really anything. It's actually still one of the most dense, pl densely populated places in the entire country. Then on the bottom, just to illustrate density again, it's a picture of the daytime population density, again by county. And what this means is that it's not about how many people live there, there's actually data collected about how many people are in each county during the day. It helps manage commute flows, and so it's, it's interesting data. I'm not entirely sure who collects it or how it is collected. Um, and you see um, all the way on the right-hand side, there's that red line that sticks all the way up. That would be New York County. And if you look closely and you go to the original source, you can kind of see Boston and San Francisco, and the rest of the country is basically flat. So in addition to being hard to build Wi-Fi in some of those, those red spots, um, what is it that we're going to do with all this? And the speed we get today, eh, it's cool. We made the, the medium a bit more efficient. Um, but really, we're looking at a world in which you have to change the way you build networks. So in the words of Spinal Tap, how do we turn it up to 11? And I am actually going to say something really nice about wired networking here, which is that we've got an important lesson to learn about what they do. Anybody remember this product? Yeah. Um, this, is one of the, this is actually one of the best hubs ever built. I knew somebody at um, the UNH Interoperability Lab, and this product passed more tests than just about any other hub they ever saw. But it's still a hub. Now, I'm going to, to require you to suspend um, disbelief in the timeline here. Um, because, of course, 802.11ac APs came out. And so we've, we've got another form of a hub. Well, where the suspension of disbelief comes in, comes in is that this picture here, and by the way, this is kind of a hard picture to find. Um, that's a Kalpana ether switch. So this is before my time in the industry. Anybody know the name Kalpana? Good. So you remember how much it cost? <laughs> um, so there are a couple interesting notes about this. Um, one, of course, is that they said, hmm, we can, we can build something that's kind of like a bridge, but it has multiple ports. Um, they didn't actually fully implement Ethernet. That's why it's called a switch, because it wasn't going to be a bridge. Um, so the marketing people got a hold of that one. I guess there's a lesson for us there, right, Keith? <clears throat> and it was $1,500 a port. Well, that's a lot of money, but it was, it was not as bad as what it would be to have done the same thing in a routed port. And it's sort of funny to read about this thing. It's $1,500 a port, not wire speed, not non-blocking. It has none of the attributes that we think of as having a switch, but they still sold a lot of them. Um, other interesting note, Kalpana was named after one of the founder's wives, I think. But it was cool. A third of the cost of a router, and you can get the exact same performance. Well, sort of. You can get very similar performance. So what is it that we're going to do to get out of this hub world in 802.11ac? And so the answer, well, I can't show you that, because we haven't built those yet. Um, I admit that this is me trying to um, put in a picture that has absolutely no relevance at all. Um, I saw the little Lego Boba Fett, and I thought, that is so cool, I have to find a way to get this in. So this is, I admit, this is totally tenuous. It's just cool. Um, so 
Um, Boba Fett was, was talking about how when he's sad, and I thought, well, I, I don't want anybody to be sad. I'm on first. I want everybody to be really excited. And so if he's talking about 802.11 things that are basically hubs, so I replace sad with slow. And so when you're slow, you should stop being slow. You should be awesome instead. And so that's what we're trying to do here. So how is it that we're going to be awesome? Well, we're going to catch a wave. And I am amazed by some of the things that people build out of Legos. Um, when I, I looked for pictures of waves, this was the coolest one I could find, because this actually is a wave. Somebody's caused it to curve and attach the surfboard to it. And wow, like there are a lot of people who have time on their hands to do crazy things. So how is it we're going to do this? Everybody knows we had beamforming in 11n, right? So how many implementations did we have? This is really the important, so the biggest thing that you can do with a spec that people don't implement is you can figure out why, and you can write the spec better. In the case of 802.11ac, the most important thing we did for beamforming was to make it easier. You know what happens when you have four options that you can negotiate between one end and the other? Interesting note. Think of the number of options you have and the number of chip vendors you have. This may or may not be a coincidence. I'll leave it to you to figure out. The biggest thing we did in 11AC was we took away choices. Choice is great. I, I love choice. But when you're trying to build products, sometimes it's not always the best thing. And <clears throat> there are many advantages to settling on just one thing. Um, there are important advantages in security. This isn't really a security topic, but um, it is with some consternation that I observe how a lot of security protocols allow you to negotiate absolutely everything. Because of course, all that code's impeccably well-written and bug-free, right? So in 11AC, the biggest thing we did with beamforming is there's only one way to do it. Well, that's great, because we can now actually use it. Um, <clears throat> beamforming isn't magical. It's um, on the receive end. It's kind of like going like this. At least. It's like going like that if you didn't fly in yesterday and your right ear is still a little plugged up. Thank you very much, airlines. What we're really doing is everything in radio communication is about SNR, signal to noise ratio. Beamforming is just one of the many tools we have to increase the SNR. And the, the advantage of that is that that allows you to go faster. There is no practical limit. If you go back and you, you study Claude Shannon, he'll tell you, oh yeah, you can have any bit rate you want as long as you have any signal to noise ratio you want. Great, okay, so how do I get a signal to noise ratio of a million dB? Well, you don't really. So <clears throat> we have beamforming. The other thing that we did in 11AC is it, it's called explicit beamforming, which means that um, you, you actually signal and you do, this, you do the setup. It's not guessing about what you see based on the, on the transaction. So we're going to actually go and say, tell me what, the, hey, other end of the link, tell me what the channel's like, and you get a response. So rather than, than guessing, so right now I'm, I'm trying to do explicit, sorry, implicit information transmission. I'm talking and I kind of have to look out at you and see if you're nodding, see if you're falling asleep, uh, see if you're reaching in your bag for something to throw. Um, which if you do this again, Keith, uh, I don't know if you know about the, um, the technique that Shmukon uses. Um, they put in little balls, and you're allowed to throw a ball if you don't believe the presenter. I think that's probably good that I didn't tell you this beforehand, <laughs> given that I'm the first speaker. But that, that's what they do. Um, so maybe I should be glad there's nothing made of foam in there. Um, maybe, we'll, maybe I'll start seeing paper airplanes now. Um, <clears throat> so we've got this, this technique that we use where we're doing this based on measuring exactly what's going on on the channel, and that allows us to ring out a couple more dB. Um, 
decibels are pretty big. I once worked for somebody who told me, oh, no, that's okay. It's only a dB. It was my boss. I said, can I have a dB raise? <laughs> he thought about it for a little while. He said no. <laughs> but he also never said a dB was small again, so I, I, I still, I call that accomplishing my goal. And we know that guessing is hard. Um, the, uh, the, the, the most common thing I cite is actually work that Andrew did years ago. Um, how long ago was that post on ClientLink? Oh, a couple years ago. <laughs> right, you don't even remember it was that long ago. Um, so that was, a, that was an attempt to, to guess at what's going on on the channel. So if I, if I get something back, that's good. If I don't get something back, and uh, well, that, that worked okay sometimes. The idea is that we want to make this technology something that works all the time. It's much better if your technology to increase SNR actually increases SNR. So beamforming underlies multi-user MIMO. This is really cool stuff. This is how we're, we're building the equivalent of the Wi-Fi switch. So a lot of people know the, the first couple of points. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot about multi-user MIMO we don't know. I would love to get up and tell you about how this is being implemented and how this is going to work and, and we're going to build APs and what the schedule is going to be and all of these little minute technical details about what it means for you building a network. You know what the problem with that is? <coughs> Not really so much with chips yet. And therefore, we don't have a ton of real world experience. So um, hopefully next year I can actually talk about real world experience as we've, we've started to build products and, and so all of the questions that I'm going to leave you with, and you can ask, but I'm going to say, you know, without an implementation, it's really hard to answer that question. Um, hopefully next year we can come back and we can have a conversation about what this actually means. So um, when we go and when we do something like multi-user MIMO, um, we've got to continue measuring the channel. Um, we're going to have to do this a lot more often, so I'll get into that. And <clears throat> um, the big driver here is, um, or a couple of drivers, one is just general density. And the second one is, I look out across the room, I see a number of laptops, but those are big and heavy and I see a lot of phones, I see a lot of tablets, I see a lot of devices that can't take advantage of the full capabilities of access points that we've got now. So if you have, say, three phones, why is it that only one of them gets to use the medium at once? And multi-user MIMO is the answer to that. So to do this, we need to know what the radio channel is like in between the device and the AP. So we've got to do our explicit channel measurement. That makes sense. Um, <clears throat> and so it's a way of taking one of our spatial streams, or two of our, you know, however many we want, and we're trying to send a spatial stream to a receiver. So now we've got our AP, we've got three phones, um, and the AP, if it supports multiple spatial streams, we can say stream one goes to this phone, stream two goes to this phone, stream three goes to this phone. And the cool thing about that is that waves of any sort add by just superposition. You have a wave that goes like this, you have a wave that goes like this. The way you combine them is you just add them, which means that if we have a wave that goes this way, this way and a wave that goes this way, and we add them, we have two waves that go in two different directions at the same time. So note number one, we can't send two waves in the same direction because then we'll get two waves all mixed together and that's not going to work. So how far apart do these things have to be? If I want to send something this way and I want to send something this way, what's the angular separation we need? Darn good question. We're probably going to learn it over the next year. Um, we don't know right now. And it may vary from chip vendor to chip vendor. Um, this is something called inter-user or inter-client inter interference because at some point we bring these things close enough together and one person's signal is another person's noise. Effectively, what we're doing here is we're trading a, a bit of our peak speed for overall network throughput. 
So would it be better if everything did three or four spatial streams and occupied the radio all at once? Absolutely. But those aren't the clients we have. We've got to build a network with the clients people are using, not the clients we want them to be using. We lost that battle a long time ago. People bring whatever they want under the network. We lost that battle, and we admitted we lost that battle when we invented DHCP. So what we're doing is we're trying to come up with a way of saying, all right, well, instead of transmitting only to one device, I'm going to transmit to multiple devices. Now, each of these, they'll interfere with each other a little bit. How much? Another really good question. And so we're still all about signal-to-noise ratio. The difference is that now we've got three transmissions going on at the same time. It's not this AP interferes with this AP. It's on this AP, I've got transmissions to each client that potentially increase the noise and therefore reduce the SNR and the speed. So is it better to have a single device that's operating at the, total, at the maximum throughput? Yep, it is. But in this case, we're saying, but rather than have just a single stream device running at maximum speed, maybe it's better to have two or three or four devices all running at the same time at a step down. If you look at um, the performance requirements in 11AC, there's a neat table that tells you what the expected SNR for each data rate is. Um, if you look at it, it will tell you that you need like 5 to 7 dB to do 256 qualm. So odds are, and again, this is a guess, we can talk about this in the future, we will probably not be able to do multiple 256 qualm streams to individual devices in a multi-user MIMO world. That's my guess. Um, that's a guess, not a no. <clears throat> so the, uh, the cool thing about this is that we get to, we, we get to have this world in which we, we have a switch, we steer everything. Um, because, of, because this is this audience and not a general interop audience or some other trade show where I might speak, I'm actually not afraid of talking a little bit about matrix math. Um, if you read the spec, um, we use a variety of matrices, and part of that is that a matrix describes what we're trying to do really well. You have a transmitter, and you have a path from each of the, the transmitters on the AP to each receiver. So you've got all kinds of paths, and you want to know what's going on with each of the OFDM carriers in here, and you want to map that into how do I do a transmission? And you think about it, it's like, okay, so I've got one channel, it has at least 50 carriers, but honestly, who uses 20 megahertz channels in 11AC? So, okay, a lot more carriers, and I've got to, to understand the performance of each of these carriers from each antenna on the AP to each potential receiver I have, the only way to keep track of that in any sort of sensible way is to use a matrix. So as, by, as an introduction to the terminology, uh, we have several letters. So H is the matrix in the spec, and you can go and look and you can see all kinds of ugly math about what each of the constituents of these matrices are. I already have it hard enough being um, up right, right, right away in the morning so um, we'll just talk about these by their letters, not by every single piece of information we could put in them. H describes the matrix that um, goes between the AP and any one of its clients. But we may want to cause the energy to go in a, di in a direction. We're talking about beam forming and steering. So the matrix that does that is called Q. I like to think of it as um, in the James Bond movies, you've got Q who supplies all this cool technology and makes things work. Same thing for beamforming. Then when we're deriving this and putting it together, um, if you actually sent this matrix, it would be gigantic. So there's a way of compressing it so that when you do that, that channel measurement, the client sends back a matrix called V, which is called the feedback matrix. And what that does is it lets you say, hmm, so based on what I get in the feedback matrix, now I know how to take my channel measurement, and I, na I now know how to calculate Q, the steering matrix, to go ahead and make something go in a particular direction. 
So normally, um, with an omnidirectional antenna, we've got our AP, and so we, we have this described so that when we have Q, now in this case we're not steering yet, so Q is basically a, an identity matrix, times H, the channel, everything goes in the same direction. That's, that's not really steering, because Q isn't really doing anything. We want Q to do something. So after we derive Q, we say, hey Q, we need some help. Um, in that case, you, when you multiply the channel matrix describing what is normally going in every direction, you multiply it by Q, it goes more in one direction than another. So that's why one of those arrows is longer. This is actually a lot more, uh, the, the spec takes a lot more to describe this, way more pages than just this one slide. Well, you only gave me an hour. <laughs> So that's cool. We can preferentially steer stuff. We gotta make sure that they don't overlap too much. It's actually a little bit more complicated than that, which is we wanna do something called null steering. So just, so what I've been talking about is we want signal to go someplace. So if I've got a transmission for Keith, yeah, we wanna, we wanna send it at Keith. But it's just as important not to let any of the rest of you in on the secret. So if you look at what happens in a beamform transmission, you get both hot spots and cold spots. You want a hot spot to land on the client, but you want a, sp a cold spot to land on everything else. And this is about, again, this idea of trying to avoid interference between devices. So I've gone back to this picture. Um, as you might guess, I drew this picture once and just cut and paste and added new stuff on it. And it looks this good because the O'Reilly has an illustration department. Um, they're actually used to working with authors who do terrible artwork. Um, and if you saw the artwork that I used to do for them, you'd realize how great they are. Um, they, were, they were overjoyed that um, in the 11AC book, I actually did my art electronically and they could read it. Everything up until that point had been uh, pen on paper. So in this picture at the bottom, we're, we're trying to, so we, we've gone back and we've got our multi-user transmission. We've got an AP that's got four streams. We're trying to send two to the blue client and one to each of the red and green clients. And we're, to get this separation, it's not just about um, when I said, oh, you wanna make sure that they're separated enough by angle. That's, that's an approximation. What we're really trying to do is make sure that when you send a transmission to one, it's not going to the others. So in this case, we've got three steering matrices. So we've got a steering matrix for blue, one for red, and one for green. So at the top, what you see is that we've got um, the, the channel matrix H. And so when we take the green steering matrix times the blue channel matrix, so Q green times H blue, we don't wanna get anything. You don't want to see anything that's not destined for you. And so if you're trying to steer the transmission to the green client, you don't want it to land on blue. Same thing for red. What you want is that when you take your steering matrix for blue, multiply it by the channel matrix for blue, you wanna get signal there. But you also, it's just as important not to get signal for the other devices. How well is this going to work? Great question. We can talk about that next year. <clears throat> this is actually, so that there's an interesting lesson in here about what this means for the number of multiple multi-user MIMO devices you can receive as well. The ability to steer a matrix uh, to, to use the steering matrix to, to get a transmission shaped the way you want depends on the number of degrees of freedom you have. And this is related to the number of driven antenna elements you have. So it may actually be better, let's say you have a, you, you have two devices. Um, you have, um, they're both three stream APs, but one of them is, has three transmitters and one has four transmitters. Now in terms of the performance difference you get 
in this single user world we've been working with up until now, it may not be that big a difference. You'd expect the 4x4 device to do a slightly better job because it's got some extra sensitivity. Well, that comes into play much stronger in multi-user MIMO because you get an extra degree of freedom. That enables you, it's not so much about steering the signal, it's about steering the signal away from other devices. So in a multi-user MIMO world, these aren't necessarily equivalent and they may not be, they, they may not be such close cousins. I don't know that I'd pay a lot extra for a 4x4 three-stream device, but in multi-user MIMO, you might want to because you're able to better steer the transmissions away from each of the receivers. And that's important because, again, this is all about signal-to-noise ratio. The more effectively we can make these nulls land on non-intended receivers, the better off we're going to be. And it's that mixing um, of your signal and the signal for another receiver that determines how effective you're going to be in terms of achieving good speed. But this isn't all we have to worry about. So that up until now, we've been down in the phi. Now we have to go to the Mac, which is really where um, most of us in the room are more comfortable. Um, so there are a couple of things we have to do. One is we've got to figure out how to get our feedback. So this is something you'll see. Um, if, you, if you look in a sniffer, you'll start to see this when this comes out. Um, <clears throat> the method of doing, uh, of uh, getting this beamforming information is called null data packets. And basically what it is, is it's, a, it's an 802.11 packet that, sa that has a bunch of known data in its carriers. And therefore, when you see it, you say, oh, I know exactly what was transmitted because it's a known pattern. I know how it was received. And so therefore from that, I can figure out what the channel looks like and that enables me to, to do this steering. So um, in order to, to get this, um, the AP will first send a, a, an announcement saying, hey, I'm about to do this. Then it will send this NDP, the null data packet. And from each receiver, you'll get a feedback packet that enables you to um, calculate the steering matrix. There are, of course, a bunch of options in what you send in the steering matrix. Some of them are bigger than others. It depends, as you might expect, on the channel size. It depends on how good you want your data to be. You've got a couple of different um, options for resolution. You can compress some of them. You cannot compress some of them. Um, it depends on, um, and, and it depends on how often you want to get this information as well. You wind up having to get to to assemble the steering matrix every time. It, so there's a lifetime on this. So I've I've shown this exchange. You have to do this to, to get a good idea of what's going on. The analogy that I often use is this is kind of like um, if you're hanging out in some place with a strobe light and you uh, don't get headaches from them. What you're trying to do is get an idea of where all the devices are. So in single user beamforming, you have to do this, call it 10 times a second because you turn on the lights, you say, oh, my receiver's there. And then you wait 100 milliseconds. Oh, my receiver's moved over there. It's pretty easy to track because what you care about is your relation as an AP to the receiver of this, in, uh, of, of this data. And yeah, they move around, but 10 times a second is plenty. In a multi-user world, it's not just the transmitter and the receiver it's actually the transmitter and every other receiver. So remember, we have to worry about overlap in transmissions. So we need to do this measurement quite a bit more often, um, possibly up to every 10 milliseconds. Now fortunately for us, at the speeds we're talking about in 11 AC, 10 milliseconds is actually a long time. Um, but it's going to happen much more often. We're gonna to have to crank up the frequency on the strobe because we need to be able to get our snapshot 
of what the landscape looks like much more often. So you'll see this a lot more often. Um, and again, this is, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure Wireshark has already written the decode for this, um, or at least I saw a reference to it. So it's there, um, and we'll start to see it more often. Continuing on in the Mac, there's a really interesting thing that's going to happen to queuing here. Again, I can't, I can't tell you exactly what's going to happen. I can just tell you this is something that we're thinking about. So what does quality of service look like when I might be transmitting to any number of devices at the same time? And roughly speaking, what we're going to do is we still have to serve high priority data. But let's say you have a multi-user capable voice phone. So voice packets come along. Those are pretty high priority. So we're going to transmit our voice packet. Well, at the same time, maybe if we know, having done some channel measurements, that we've got voice packets for a phone, but off in some other direction, we've got some data that we'd probably just as rather just as, as soon drop on the floor, but we can transmit it at the same time. So we're transmitting both the highest priority data to the primary receiver, and we're sort of bundling up everything else we can um, because it's there, we can transmit it. So maybe even if you're doing some sort of bulk data, you know, we've deprioritized BitTorrent on your network because you're, of course, downloading Linux ISOs. Um, that as, the, as this voice call goes, you've got this low priority traffic going in a completely different direction. Um, so that's kind of cool to think about. Um, I, I, I wait for the day when somebody says, hey, you know, my deprioritized traffic is working really well. No, walk over to that corner of the room. Because you have somebody who's on their voice call, um, they're getting high priority service, and that is creating an opportunity for, for you sitting in a, in a different direction to get the same data, or to get data at the same time. So what does all this mean for us today? Because it's all fine and good for me to come and say, hey, look, here's this cool stuff that's happening, and you should be aware of all of this. But when we leave, we're all going to go out, and we're all going to have to build networks today. It is with some irony that I went looking for a Cat5 cable picture to put in a wireless talk. But there are some pretty simple things to do today. Um, the, the most important one being, if you help somebody put in a network tomorrow, well, tomorrow you're at the conference. If you help somebody put in a network next week, make sure that they're not going to be disappointed with you next year. When you look at the speed, when we get all this stuff coming out, it could be up to three and a half gigabits. It's a lot. But that's a speed that comes from using the absolute widest possible channel and assuming that everybody is close enough to use the highest data rate. Um, you'll be fine with two cables. And there's actually a, a bunch of cool stuff going on in the Ethernet world that we might be able to use as well. Um, so if we say, hmm, the second wave of product comes out in 2015, then um, you want to have multiple gigabits at each AP location. Eh, two cables is fine. Cat6 is not that much more expensive. It's $40, $50 a kilofoot more. And the cost of cabling, as you all know, is the cost to pull it in. So just put in two cables now. You'll thank me later. You do want to, as you're thinking about how cool this multi-user MIMO thing is, if you have a network that doesn't have a lot of mobile devices that are single stream, it may actually not benefit you all that much. So help customers know what's on their network. Um, are, is it a lot of single stream devices that will benefit? Or are they using this as an ethernet replacement for laptops and desktops, in which case this might not matter as much. So think about where the gains come in um, and how that relates to what devices are out there. And also importantly, 
don't let people sit and wait. Just because we can't deliver multi-user MIMO today doesn't mean they can't use the speed. When you have faster devices, they get off the air quicker. This is still good. It's not everything that everybody hopes. But if you remember the first wave of 11N access points, that was not what people wanted either. But it was important to get experience with this, understand what it meant, and um, to help people get ready for the future. And that's why we do this. Um, it's important for us to make sure that, that people don't sit around waiting for something um, when they can get benefit today. So my closing slide, as um, many of you know, I'm a pilot. And I haven't mentioned airplanes yet in the presentation. That's because it comes at the end. So I sort of facetiously said, sky's the limit for Wi-Fi. Um, the plane that's pictured there was a world altitude record setting plane. Uh, it's a glider made by a German company, now defunct, called Grobe. It's a Grobe 102, single place glider. Um, the club I belong to owns one of them. Um, in the mid 80s, a comic book store owner in the Owens Valley in California decided that he wanted to set a world record. One day, the conditions looked like they were absolutely right. So he put on his winter jacket and like three pairs of socks and went flying. He was absolutely right. The conditions were stunning. He rode a mountain wave up to 40 odd thousand feet without supplemental oxygen. He talked about the flight, how it was really hard when he got up that high, because in addition to being kind of hard to breathe, um, his eyes were watering, but it was so cold that his tears were freezing in his eyes at the same time. But he did it. He set a world record uh, when he landed. There was talk of uh, taking away his pilot license. Because as some of you may know, in order to go above 18,000 feet, you're supposed to be on an instrument flight plan. Um, and therefore not a battery powered glider. Um, they, it wasn't actually a rule at that point. So he, he was the world record holder, although there now is a rule that says to hold a world record, you can't break airspace regulations to do it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and um, as it, it turns out, um, there are now procedures in place to go above 18,000 feet in a glider in some, some special parts of the country. Um, I have not done that yet. Um, I have, however, flown a Grobe 102. Uh, the, the trace on the right is a flight trace of a three and a half hour flight I had. Um, and so the, the lesson I take away from this is just as I have to push myself to be a better pilot and to do things that sometimes are uncomfortable because they're good for me in the long run, uh, the same is true for us in networking, that if you're not continually learning, uh, you're not doing your job. So um, one of the really cool things about aviation is that recurrent training and getting better at your job is a really important part of being a pilot. It's also a really important part of being in networking. That's why I'm here. And I'm glad to see all of you here, too, for the same reason. So thank you for listening. <laughs>